Hello, Internet. What's happening? We have sort of a problem here. Apparently, you've been indenting your code too much. You see, we're keeping our code on the left now. Did you get the memo about that? Yeah, if you could just go ahead and keep your code on the left from now on, that'd be great. And I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Bye-bye, Internet. Hey chatters, my name's Brendan, and in today's episode of Dev Chatter, we're going to be talking about indenting our code, why you're probably doing it too much, and what you should be doing instead, in a few different ways. Let's get started. If you were to open up a solution on the internet and take a look at the code that's in there, I think you wouldn't be surprised to find something that looks like this. And that is... You have a bunch of code that kind of kind of moves over and then comes on back. And you get kind of this, you know, this triangle structure. And, well, we need to stop doing that. <laughs> because if we take a look at this and we try to go, okay, uh, user data is not null. Okay, so, but I can see what happens if user data is not null. That's we continue on. But what happens if it is? Well, I have to go and I click on this, and you'll notice I even have an extension installed to help me keep track of curly braces. Notice the colors, and I come down here to the yellow one down here that's marked, and then I say, okay, ah, here's the else. Okay, so I can figure out that, and I want to see, oh, okay, if you're just not valid, well, I can't see what happens when it's invalid. So what do I have to do? I have to go to this, and I got to come down here, and I got to say, okay, if it's if it's not valid, then we're going to throw an argument exception saying it was invalid. Okay, and then I go through this one and I say, okay, yeah, that, 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 that. All right, and I'm in nested in really far. And that's fine. You can write code like this. But should you? Let's make it a little bit easier to read. Because I think if the case is just you continue on to the next step, then that wasn't the important one. The important action was what happened if you didn't have a value or if it was invalid. And we as humans tend to think in the positives. And so this is kind of like reversing our thought here. But as the reader we probably want to see the escapes that happen. And we can do that. We just need to do this. So let's go in and let's flip these if statements. Let's invert the if. And so when I do that, you'll see, oh, user data equals null. Okay. If user data is null, what happens? I throw an argument null exception. Awesome. Okay. Do I need this else? Because if I went in here, I threw this, otherwise I was down here. So no, no, I don't need this else. So I can just get rid of that and get rid of that. This code can lose an indentation. So I said your code was getting too far to the right. Let's go ahead and get it to the left again. This next one. Okay, if it's valid, we just continue on. But what did we do if it was invalid? Because, again, that seems more relevant. Like, what? Do, how do we handle it if it's not valid? Okay, we can go in again and invert the if. And after inverting the if, we get this. Now you can see if it's invalid, we throw an argument exception. Hey, I get what's going on here now. And we can look and say, oh, we don't need this else either. So we lose another level of indentation. Then, all of a sudden... Our code is flattened. So if you want to take a look at the flattened file, this code is all in a GitHub repository. You can find a link down below that will take you to our GitHub repository, and you can take a look at the code. This is basically what the flattened version of the code looks like. You can go a couple of steps further, but I didn't in the flattened version. You can remove this else, remove this else, because again, if you returned, you didn't go on to do the next check. Again, if you returned, you didn't go on to do this check. And if you returned, you didn't go on to this one. So this else can also go away. So we've essentially said if you didn't if you didn't get guarded away by these or leave through one of these, you'll hit that one. And this one essentially is you didn't match one of these enums. So this is basically an enum check. Okay. This is flattened normal version of guard clauses. These ifs are called guard clauses, even though they're not really anything special. So when you think guard clauses, it doesn't have to be a special thing. It can just mean if. Let's talk about a more structured guard clause. To do this one, we're going to open up one of the classes that we have included in this sample. Guards. 
This is our custom guards that we built for this project. If you want to do this, you can create your own guards, static class, and inside, yes, static, I know, these are supposed to be simple and able to be tested as part of a unit test, so you shouldn't worry about them. There's no dependence on database, file system, system clock, anything like that. So if your unit test can't run with these guard clauses in here, you were doing some weird unit testing anyway. Okay, so inside we have a couple of static methods. The static method here is against null. So we're saying guard against null, pass in our object that should not be null, and tell us the name of it. Now, the reason we need the name is because when we throw the exception, it's an argument exception, we want to say what the argument name was that we were passed, not what it is here. We want to know what it was in the method that had the problem so that we're more likely to get the right information. So what do we do? We say, hey, if it was null, that's our if check, throw this exception. Hey, wait a minute. Isn't this the code that we had at the top of the method? Why, yes, it was a smart person watching this video. Okay, one note here. I have a little bit of complexity. I like making this generic. You could leave that out and just make this an object and take anything, but I like the generic I like the generic because you always then get the information about the type and you could if you wanted to do something with this because you've got the type. So you could include it in information, something like that, or handle it differently for different types. It's up to you. Okay, next one we want to look at is against invalid. This method, oh, we did it again. This is the same code from the next part of the method. Okay, so I think you get the idea. We're taking these and we're wrapping these in reusable static methods. And we just called it guard against because you can read that and say, yeah, guard against this, guard against that. And so we're saying guard against invalid. In this case, we wrote this. The intention is that this will overload with any other objects that you're going to check the validity of. So guard against invalid and take any object you want to be able to check that with. So you don't have to worry about interfaces. Just make an overload, do your check. It's fine. If you end up getting tons of those, then, you know, extract it, refactor, make it more advanced. But don't, don't worry about that right away. Just do the simple thing that works. So again, we take in the object, we take in the name, and we check on that object, hey, is this valid? If not, throw the exception. Otherwise, do nothing. Okay, next one. Down here in the bottom, you're, you're, you're going, wait a minute. We only had two if checks in the first thing. This is not the if check. You're right. This is not the if check. What did we do here? So in this one, we said guard against an invalid enum. I like, again, to make it generic, and I restrict it to being an enum. So we take in an object, we confirm it's an enum, and I say enum is defined. I like this approach because I can just say, hey, is that enum in this type set? If it is, cool. Additionally, by doing it this way, I can just say, yeah, was this one of them? Excellent. If it wasn't, throw the exception. You might remember this was the bottom of the code. Let's take a look at what our method looks like if we're using these guard clauses that we just created. If we open up the guarded example, which is this one, you're going to notice a couple of things. First off, that beginning got way shorter and clearer. We just said guard against null, guard against invalid, guard against invalid enum. Done. All done. We've done our checks. Now down here, we can just handle the valid cases that we want to handle. So that is the professional tier, this is the enterprise tier, and down here is the personal tier. Excellent. That works the way that we wanted it to. Let's take a look at another example. Thanks to a good friend of mine, Ardalis, the internet actually has a NuGet package available for guard clauses. It's ardalis.guard clauses. And we have included that in our project. If we open up our csproj file, you'll see package reference Ardalis guard clauses. Now, when you use those, we have a using statement at the top, we just say our Dallas guard clauses is what we're using, and then down here we get something that looks a lot like our other code. So notice we are not using this namespace, as you may have seen in the original guarded. In the our Dallas guarded one, what we end up getting is guard.against.null. So again, this has a little bit more structure. If you want one that's customizable and more advanced, that doesn't require that you write all the code, I didn't have to write any code for this. I was just able to use these. So he has some defaults for null, and he's got people that help support this. It's open source. 
So it's not just Steve building this. We get nice stuff. Guard against invalid input, guard against enum out of range. So enum out of range, I don't know exactly how it works. Maybe he implemented it the same way I did. I don't know, but I'm sure it checks those things. Again, it takes in the type and a name. And invalid input, again, it takes in your object in this. And you go, wait a minute, how does he know how to check validity of your user data object, Brendan? Well, that's easy, he doesn't. This one just takes in a predicate for how you determine validity. So I just pass this in as x dot, you know, x lambda x dot is valid. And that works just fine. I could also do this, uh, that you could write this other ways. And maybe you don't have an is valid method and you say, well, it's only valid if the ID is greater than, you know, zero or something like that. Okay, that's fine. I don't know how to determine validity on your object. If you've got it in a method, call a method. If you don't, put in whatever you want. This is the predicate. If this is false, it throws an exception. If it's true, it does it just fine and, and ignores it. And null is an easy one. He also has versions of like null or empty and things like that. So you can do some more advanced checks without having to write them yourself. So if you like that, you can use these ones. And as I said, it's got more structure. So you might notice if you put your cursor over against that it is an I guard clause. And so there are a bunch of pieces to this, but the concept remains the same. Everything's to the left. It's nice and clear to read. And you don't end up with that indented stuff where you can't see what's going on. Hey, thanks for watching, Chatters. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Dev Chatter, and if you did, be sure to click the like button, the subscribe button, comment down below, do all the other stuff on YouTube, and all that kind of stuff. You know how it works. Why am I telling you this? And if you want to catch us live or talk to us offline, you can catch us live, links down below, or join our Discord. Again, down below. We'll see you next time, and we appreciate you following the channel and sharing it with your friends. Take care, and happy coding, everyone.